Hello, uh, my name is Gunnar Arslan. I am one of the founding members of the Dialogue Institute Austin, which is an educational nonprofit here in Austin, Texas. Uh, our mission our mission is to promote mutual understanding, respect and cooperation among people of diverse faiths and cultures by creating opportunities for direct communication and meaningful shared experiences. Or in short, we find excuses to bring people together. This virtual meeting is a continuation of our series of events we call Dialogue Matters, where we invite a speaker to, uh, from various backgrounds to share something about something important for them. Our last one was a month ago uh, about Catholicism. Today, I'm gonna talk about my faith tradition, Islam. My presentation is mostly geared towards people who have no or limited understanding of Islam. I generally uh, use this presentation uh, at churches or synagogues uh, where I'm occasionally invited to speak about Islam and related topics. So without uh, delaying any further, let me dive into if I can figure this out. Okay, so so this is a, a picture of the capital of Texas highway in uh, Austin, Texas. And uh, if somebody approached you and asked you what the rules governing this highway is, uh, or more specifically, if someone asked you, what is the speed limit on this particular highway? Uh, you could figure that out in different ways. One way would be uh, you would just measure the speed of the cars driving by, collect all the data, and then pick the highest speed you see as the speed limit. Well, it is apparent, the, the flaw is apparent in this method, right? Uh, because uh, you actually don't know, you, the assumption there is that everybody follows the speed limit you actually don't know if that's the case. So what you should be doing is you should be looking at uh, official posted speed limit signs. So why am I talking about speed limits? limits? Because uh, looking at the speeds uh, are at the cars on the highway and trying to figure out what the rules of that highway is, is exactly what people and uh, many people in the West do about Islam. They look at Muslims and mostly Muslims they see in the media who are there on TV because they have done something crazy and try to figure out what Islam is about. That only makes as much sense as trying to figure out the speed limit on a highway by looking at the cars driving. So if there's any, uh, if there's only one message I'd like to uh, leave you with here, it would be to basically don't do that. I mean, if you want to learn more about uh, my faith tradition or any other faith tradition for that matter, let's go to the sources, the official post sign post, uh, speed limits post, and figure out what, what that faith tradition is about. Once you know that, you can then judge who is following the tradition and who is not. So without delaying, uh, let me get to uh, my main part of the presentation. So the first uh, verse here is, uh, it's a verse from the Quran, chapter three, verse 83. And uh, let me just read it first. Say, we believe in God and that which was been revealed to us and that which was revealed to Abraham and Ishmael and Isaac and Jacob and the tribes and that which was given to Moses and Jesus and other people and the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and to him we submit. So the idea here is that Islam is not a new religion. Islam is the continuation of the Judeo Christian tradition that actually traces, you can actually trace back all the way to Adam. So the, the worldview that Islam has is God created the first human being, Adam. He is also the first 
uh, prophet because he was re uh, receiving revelation from God. Uh, but the, the very next generation, the sons of uh, Adam started already uh, killing each other. So th that tells us human beings are inherently forgetful uh, and we go astray. So God sends another prophet with uh, another message or a messenger and tries to bring us back to the straight path. And then we forget, God sends another messenger. We forget and God sends another messenger. And that's what all these uh, prophets are uh, in, the, in this lineage. We just believe that Jesus and Muhammad are the last two of those prophets. Uh, and so without going into much detail of that, uh, I'd like to start talking about the Islamic faith, the pillars of faith. So these are six items that Muslims believe in. And they are the existence and oneness of God, the uh, prophets, holy scriptures, angels, destiny, and the hereafter. So I'm gonna dive uh, quickly with one or two slides into each of them. So unity of God or the oneness and the existence of God is the key message of Islam. I mean, if you have to summarize Islam with one, uh, with one uh, word, it's, uh, it's one sentence, there is no God but God, la ilaha illallah. That would be the main message of Islam. And here I have a verse, Allah is he than whom there is no other God who knows all things, both secret and open. He most gracious, most merciful. So Allah is the proper name of God. And if you were to go to an Arabic country and find a Christian there, and there are lots of uh, Christian Arabs, uh, especially if you go to Lebanon, for example, and just ask uh, for their Bible, Everywhere where an English Bible uses the word God, that Bible would be using the word Allah. So it's, uh, it's not a new deity. It's the same God, the Lord, the, the creator of the universe. Uh, you might wonder, uh, I, well, I have a translation of the whole verse here, but I still used Allah instead of God uh, in, in that translation. And the reason is actually uh, pretty simple. Uh, Muslims prefer to use Allah even when speaking English or uh, any other language for that matter, because in English, God, a, God is not is ambiguous. When I say God, it's not clear whether I'm talking about a God with small g or the God with a capital G. And again, the central message, the most important aspect of Islam is there is only one God. We want to absolutely make sure that everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about, whom I'm talking about, I'm talking about the God. And it's instead of qualifying it every time, just saying Allah uh, does that job. So you'll see me and many Muslims uh, talk in English, but still use the Arabic word for God, which is Allah. And in this presentation, I'm going to use both words. So they mean the same exact thing. Uh, the next thing um, we, uh, Muslims believe in is the prophets. And when I say prophets, this word is uh, one of those words which brings different ideas into mind uh, for a Muslim uh, or a Christian or a Jewish person. Uh, so although we use the same word, it, it can mean different, uh, different things to different people. For Muslim, when, you, when they use the word prophet or messenger uh, as, as a prophet, what we understand is a perfect human being chosen and protected by God uh, to represent him on earth and convey his message to the people. This is a level for a human being as high as it goes. I mean, anything beyond would be attributing uh, divinity to that person, which is an absolute no-no in Islam. So uh, without making people divine, this is the highest level you can achieve is uh, become a messenger of God. They are sinless, they are perfect human beings. So Muslims believe in all the biblical prophets. There are about 25 named uh, in the Quran. Uh, among them is Adam, Noah, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. Muhammad, uh, uh, the last and final prophet, uh, according to our belief, 
Uh, he died in 632 and his, he received his first revolution in the year 610. So uh, he was called the trusted one, El Emin, uh, even before receiving the revolution, actually more before receiving the revolution because after he received the revolution uh, in, in a polyistic society, he was uh, marginalized pretty quickly for telling, uh, talking about one God and uh, justice and uh, all the things that the polities didn't want to hear about. Uh, so at the bottom here, you see a uh, kind of little tree. Muhammad, peace be upon him, is from the lineage of Ishmael, who is the older son of Abraham, as opposed to uh, Isaac, where most of the other prophets lineage are from. So all the uh, biblical prophets are from that lineage. Uh, that's how we are connected to Abraham and why all of us are uh, like why all of, we consider ourselves one of the Abrahamic faiths. So uh, Muslims also uh, believe in the holy scriptures. And when we say scriptures, we believe in all of them in their original form. So the Talmud, the Psalms, the Torah, the New Testament, uh, the Quran, in the original form, all these uh, are words from God. Uh, but what we believe is that over time they have been lost, forgotten, uh, lost in translation, uh, intentionally, unintentionally corrupted. Uh, and today, uh, the only holy book scripture that is in the original form, we believe, is the Holy Quran. And when you look at the Quran anywhere in the world, doesn't matter you talk to uh, what, whatever sect uh, the person belongs to, uh, the Muslim belongs to, whether he is in America or China, whether he is uh, in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, when you open a Quran, they are exactly the same, word by word. So Holy Scriptures, uh, the Quran uh, was revealed to Prophet Muhammad via the Archangel Gabriel. Uh, it consists of 114 chapters, uh, was revealed over 23 years. So it's not a, here is the book, uh, go teach it. It's 23 years. And most verses were revealed upon some event, uh, a, a conundrum the Muslims found, found themselves in as an answer to a question. Uh, so it, it, it basically was a living thing that would the revelation would just come when needed uh, and would guide the way for the Muslims. It was later collected into uh, the book format that we have today. We believe that every word in the original Arabic is chosen by God. That's why uh, we don't call the translations the Quran anymore. They are the interpretation of the Quran. They have been filtered to a human intellect, if you will. Uh, the main themes are uh, unity of God. Again, that's the main message of Islam. Uh, stories of people and prophets, resurrection and hereafter, uh, prayer and worship. And when I say stories of people and prophets, many of those stories are common to the Bible. So they're very similar stories. Some of them have uh, minor differences, like the story of Abraham is a very interesting one. It's the same exact story. The only thing that changes is the son. Is it Isaac or Ishmael who was chosen uh, to be sacrificed? Uh, so that's kind of the main difference there. So we talked about official signposts. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. I'm fasting, so uh, I cannot drink water. I'm going to talk about that too. So please forgive my voice. So the Quran is our main source of uh, knowledge. And the secondary source is the Hadith. <coughs> and uh, the Hadith is just a collection of stories that uh, is by now compiled into volumes of books. These are stories and sayings of the prophet. And I'm going to keep referring to the Hadith because that's our main, again, a main body of, uh, of knowledge for us. So at the very beginning, I'm, I've talked about official speed limit signs. So if you want to see if somebody is obeying the lim speed limit or not, th these are the two sources you should first look at, uh, the Quran and the Hadith, whether somebody is following the rules of Islam or not. So that's... The main point here. So now we talked about the books. 
the next thing we uh, Muslims believe in are angels. We believe angels are beings made of light and have no gender. Unlike, unlike humans, uh, they do not have free will. They do whatever God asks them to do. Uh, they maintain the universe according to God's commands. And uh, I've listed here uh, the archangels, um, Michael, Gabriel, Azrael, and Israfil. So we already talked about Gabriel. He's the kind of the messenger bringing down the revelation. Uh, Azrael is uh, the angel that takes uh, your soul, uh, if you will, when you die. There are countless other angels. Uh, for example, it is uh, said that every single raindrop is brought down by an angel when it rains. Uh, also, Muslims believe that there are two angels on our shoulders. Each shoulder, there's one. The one on the right writes down all our good deeds and the one on the left writes down our misdeeds, if you will. So there are uh, lots of angels uh, around us all the time. Destiny, so this concept is a little complicated. Uh, I'm gonna break it up in a couple uh, sections. So the first one is uh, God creates everything and this could be good or evil because everything is created by God. Again, the message here is there's only one creator. So in some traditions, some faith traditions to avoid attributing uh, creating evil things to God, they basically have to uh, end up creating another sub deity that can do evil or create evil. That's not the case in Islam. In Islam, we believe everything is from God. Uh, and uh, the reason, that, so and God obviously wants uh, goodness for us, but he also gives us free will. And if we choose to do evil with, with that free will, God will create us. We are responsible for it. It's, it's, it's basically our duty not to commit evil, uh, if you will. Uh, but, and he knows better what is good or bad for us. Uh, something that appears to be good might be bad for us and the other way around. So if you think about this, uh, human beings are interesting. Uh, I mean, most creatures are like that. Uh, but if you talk about the human being, we are very limited. I mean, we can we we cannot we can stay without air for a very short time. We can uh, survive without water again, very, uh, maybe a couple days, uh, or we have to eat. We cannot survive for, uh, after maybe a couple months or whatever the, that number is. Uh, we have to eat. We have to drink. We have to do all these things. We cannot just decide, hey, I'm just gonna not obey the law of gravity today. I'm just gonna float to work today. Uh, we have to follow all these rules. But when it comes to one particular thing, which is choosing between good and evil, it seems like or uh, the, the, the range there we can choose from is, is amazing. So think about people, uh, uh, the, the most evil person you can think of, uh, most people think of uh, Hitler. I mean, the, 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 the suffering he has caused, the number of deaths he has caused, the number of people who died as, uh, as uh, directly as uh, based on his actions, it's beyond comprehension, uh, the evil that was committed in his name. And uh, I mean, you're not talking about killing one person, two person, which uh, is already evil enough uh, because God says in the Quran, uh, one who kills one person is, is as if we killed the entire uh, humanity. Uh, but there are people who have done this hundreds of times, thousands of times, hundred thousand times, million times, which is really beyond uh, comprehension. But on the other hand, that we have these people, uh, I mean, most traditions have uh, people they call saints. Uh, we have in, in our tradition, we, the, the perfect people again, would be the, the prophets. And these are people beyond angels, right? Uh, we talked about angels, they kind of have, they cannot, they don't have free will. So they have a fixed station. They cannot commit bad, they cannot, uh, they have to do good. So they have a fixed station. Human beings can choose to be wherever they want. They can go uh, above the angels, beyond the angels uh, in terms of goodness, or they can be below animals. 
and we have all that freedom, which kind of makes sense because uh, from the Islamic perspective, we are here on earth as a test. This is a test, it's a, it's a short test. And based on how we do here, we will be judged in the hereafter. So let's get back to the destiny part uh, that most of us understand from destiny. Uh, am I uh, following a script written for me? Uh, no, in, in not in that sense, as I said, we have free will. We do, we choose, and we do whatever we want to do. But God is beyond space and time. He knows what we're gonna do. Uh, so in that sense, it, everything that we're gonna do is known and is written down. And that's what we call destiny. So he, he doesn't, uh, he knows it because uh, he know he is beyond space and time. Uh, we don't do it because he knows it and has written it down, if, if that makes sense at all. Uh, next concept is the hereafter. Uh, Islam teaches that we stay in this life on earth a very short time. You could be living 60 years, 100 years. Um, even if you lived 200 years, it will be short compared to the eternal life in the hereafter. We believe in a heaven and a hell, and everyone will be uh, see justice on the day of judgment according to their actions on, on this earth. There is a, uh, the story of, uh, of the prophet sitting with uh, his companions and uh, the prophet, uh, peace be upon him, conveys the story of a person who passed away and is conversing with, with angels. The angels ask him, uh, how long did you stay on, uh, on earth? And the man answers, it was very short. It was like a blink of an eye. And after co conveying the story, uh, the prophet Muhammad actually adds on that and says, it's actually even shorter than that. And uh, which kind of makes sense compared to infinite life, eternal life, no matter how long it is, it will appear short to us. So our main duty here is uh, to make best use of the time we are giving, given and uh, please God and worship God as well as we can. So this was the, all the things that we believe in. Now, uh, the next set of pillars, the, there are five of them, uh, are the pillars of Islamic deeds. So these are the things that Muslims are supposed to do. Uh, the testimony of faith, the five daily prayers, almsgiving, fasting, and pilgrimage. Uh, so let me dive into those one by one. Uh, testimony of faith is the most basic tenet of, of Islam. This is actually how you would become a Muslim if you choose to do so later in your life. Uh, and if you were born a Muslim, uh, you still at one point in your life have to uh, say this and believe this, that I testify that there is no deity but God. And I testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God. That's it. Once you understand this and say this uh, and uh, accept this, you're a Muslim. The next one uh, we do, this is uh, the main ritual uh, for Muslims. This is kind of the central ritual that combines everything. And it's the five daily prayers. And again, we have a word here, we use prayer, uh, but there are different types of prayers. I mean, we have that prayer that most people think of when I say prayer, uh, where you open your hands and we would open our hands and talk to God, ask for, I don't know, uh, the, the for this pandemic to be over, for people who are sick to get better, for to protect or, or us and our families and all humans. Uh, that is a prayer that we do all the time uh, and we converse with God and talk to God and everybody has that direct connection to God. Uh, in Islam, we don't have a clergy. We don't need any intermediate between us and God. Everybody can talk to God whenever uh, he or she wants. The prayer I'm talking about here is prescribed prayer. And this is obligatory uh, for every Muslim of certain age. Uh, again, there are ways to get around the obligation in the sense that if you cannot stand, for example, you can pray sitting. If you cannot sit, you can pray lying down. But as long as you're conscious, you're supposed to pray five times a day. And uh, we stay standing, bowing, prostrating, and sitting. And we recite certain verses from the Quran at certain times. 
and other times we can choose which verses we like to uh, recite. Uh, it's done five times a day in the morning, noon, afternoon, evening, and night. Uh, these are not specific uh, times, these are time frames. So when we are talking about the evening prayer, for example, uh, you, you pray it uh, as early as possible after sunset and before it be becomes complete darkness. Uh, so that's the time frame where you're supposed to pray it, but it is recommended to pray it towards the beginning of that time frame. And when we pray, we uh, face Mecca uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're going to talk about that uh, when talking about pilgrimage, but we face uh, that direction. So that's kind of a, a concept that unites everybody. We know that somebody around the world, or it's somebody is facing Mecca and praying right now uh, at all times. Uh, and we view this uh, prayer as a personal communion with God. Uh, think about it, your, your daily busy life in the middle, uh, around uh, noon prayer, I don't know, would be around, I don't know, 1.30 p.m., uh, 2 p.m. these days. Uh, you basically stop doing whatever you're, you're doing, uh, and then you give a few minutes of your time uh, to stand and prostrate in front of God. Uh, that uh, is supposed to recenter you, bring you back to what is important. You don't have to think about the deadlines uh, or the bills or whatever occupies your mind. Actually, the prayer starts with a motion that goes like this, which kind of represents, hey, everything is behind me. Right now, I'm in front of God and nothing else matters. Uh, so it's, it's a very important concept. Uh, it's, it's, again, the central ritual for Muslims. Almsgiving, uh, there are different types of charity. Uh, zakat what is what I'm talking about here. And this is an obligatory uh, for everybody who has uh, enough wealth. And wealth uh, means if you have excess wealth of more than $1,500. I mean, I just put a number here so that makes sense to you. Uh, it's, uh, there are uh, ways to calculate this, but uh, the basic idea is take, uh, don't count anything that's essential for you, for your primary residence, your vehicle, uh, I don't know, the, the, the primary things that you need to survive right now and everything else that if taken away right now, uh, you wouldn't go hungry, uh, uh, you could still survive uh, or you could continue life as you continue it right now. Uh, that money is considered excess and is taxed by 2.5%. Uh, One fortieth of that money, uh, the way we look at it is not even ours to begin with. It's entrusted to us by God so that we give it to the poor. And uh, it's, it's a means of closing the gap between rich and poor. I mean, this is a popular concept. Uh, wealth tax is a popular concept right now in America. People are talking about it, but this was uh, instituted 1400 years ago uh, in, in Islam and uh, people have been paying this uh, in the, uh, for the past 1400 years. Uh, every year, uh, whatever money you had in, in excess, you calculate it and give it to the poor. They have very strict rules on who can receive it. So if the state collects it, they cannot just build highways with it. Uh, you, you cannot give it to family and friends it has to go to the poor. They are very, they are, they are very strict uh, uh, definitions of who can, who is qualified to receive uh, this, this particular uh, charity alms. Uh, next, a very timely topic. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm fasting because we are actually in the month of Ramadan. That's the name of the ninth month of the Islamic lunar calendar where all able Muslims are obligated to fast. And by able, I mean uh, people who are old enough, uh, they're not children, uh, who, don't, who are not currently sick, don't have a chronic disease, are not breastfeeding uh, or uh, pregnant, uh, basically anything that would put uh, you or somebody else in danger, uh, unless there is a danger like that, you are supposed to fast. The fast starts at dawn, ends at sunset, and we don't eat, drink, smoke, or take, take anything into the body during this period of time. So it's a dry fast, no water either. Uh, to survive, especially in the summer months, uh, in the long summer days, uh, especially if you're someplace like Texas, uh, where the heat goes up to 
100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, on a daily basis in summer. Uh, you, you get up early before dawn and have a meal called suhoor, uh, which is a pre-dawn breakfast, uh, if you like. Uh, and then we don't eat, drink anything during the day. And when the sun sets, we like to come with, uh, together with family and friends. Actually, as a dialogue institute in Austin, uh, we would uh, every day we would be at a different organization, mostly a church or synagogue, and we would uh, prepare the meals and we would uh, go to their place and break our fast with, with the community there. Uh, that is, until this Ramadan, we have been doing that for the past uh, few years. Obviously, this Ramadan, we are in this situation with the pandemic and uh, we are all at home breaking our fast with our families, uh, which is another blessing. Uh, I haven't had this many Ramadan iftars with my family uh, in a long time. Uh, so, I mean, why do you fast? We fast because God commands us in the Quran to fast. And actually the commandment, uh, that, uh, that verse that commands it, it says, uh, fasting was prescribed upon you as it was prescribed for those before you, referring to Christians and Jews. Uh, another indication that this is a continuation of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So we should really call it the Judeo-Christian Muslim tradition at this point. Uh, so what, what might be the wisdom behind fasting? Uh, the, my favorite one is, uh, let's say it's just before uh, sunset, you are sitting at the, uh, at the dinner table and you're really thirsty. Maybe you have spoken uh, about Islam for an hour and your mouth is really dry uh, and you, you want to drink uh, a sip of water, but you don't. And the only reason you don't is because God asks you not to do it. Uh, and as soon as the sun sets, if you're in a Muslim country, you will hear the call to prayers, which is, again, as I said, is a, a beginning of the prayer time. If you're in a Muslim home uh, in, in the Western country, most likely, uh, very likely, they have a, a clock or at least their cell phones will go off with an alarm or with a uh, call to prayer. That will be like God commanding, no, you can't eat, no, you can't drink. And only then you start, take that water and start eating and drinking. So you recognize that everything that we have is given to us by God and you recognize that he owns it and he can tell us whether to eat it or not and when to eat it or not. Uh, the obvious other benefits, self-control, hopefully uh, by doing this, you can teach yourself some control and apply it in other aspects of your life. Compassion for the hungry. I mean, it's, uh, what is it, 3 p.m. right now? Uh, this is about the time where I, uh, start feeling it where my blood sugar starts going down and I really feel tired uh, and uh, don't want to do anything. Uh, the interesting thing here is that you think about uh, hungry people and that must be how they feel all the time. So you really feel compassion uh, and empathy on a different level. Uh, I mean, they're even worse off because I know at 8, 10 p.m. today, I'll sit at a table with uh, beautiful food and with my family and God willing, if I survive uh, at, to that time, I will uh, eat uh, another meal. Most people around the world who are poor don't have that luxury. Uh, so compassion for the hungry is an important aspect of fasting. And that's why in the month of Ramadan, giving in the Muslim communities just explodes. And then Thanksgiving. So when you have that first sip of water that we talked about, uh, it really tastes differently. Uh, during the year, you drink water and you don't think twice about it. You don't think about the millions of people who don't have access to it. Uh, you complain about, I complain about the temperature of it, the taste of it. Uh, but in Ramadan, uh, after not having a glass of water, a sip of water for 18 hours straight, uh, you really are thankful on a different level uh, for everything that God gives you. So that brings us to the uh, last uh, pilgrimage, uh, which is uh, last uh, belief, uh, last action that we are supposed to do, uh, which is the pilgrimage or Hajj. Uh, again, pilgrimage has a different meaning, Hajj. Uh, that's why I put Hajj in there. Uh, pilgrimage uh, for us, when we say we, we went to a pilgrimage, we mean 
we went to a specific location at a specific time and did specific actions. There's only one time, place, and uh, kind of the ritual is predetermined. Uh, unless you do all those at the specific time in a specific place, it's not a pilgrimage for Muslims. It's not the Hajj. Uh, so again, this is obligatory uh, for all able Muslims once in a lifetime. Once you're wealthy and healthy enough to do this, you, it's an obligation upon you. And uh, Mecca is in Saudi Arabia. And uh, that's where we go. And the reason we go there is the Kaaba, which just means cube in Arabic, uh, is a cube shaped building, which we, which we believe was originally built by Prophet Adam as the first place of worship on earth. And then it was lost and later rebuilt by Abraham on the original foundation. And uh, 3 million people, more than 3 million people every year uh, do this pilgrimage. I have a picture in the next slide. Uh, that should give you an idea. Uh, the ritual dates back to Prophet Al Abraham and uh, also Hagar, uh, so the wife of Abraham, uh, the, yeah, the second wife of Abraham, let's put it that way. Uh, and all pilgrims dress in a two piece white cloth. So no matter where you come from and uh, who you are, uh, what country you come from, what language you speak, it doesn't matter, everybody is equal. And uh, this picture should give you some idea. You can see all the people uh, doing this uh, traditional cir circle impulation of the Kaaba. And then you see all the people going and coming from other parts of uh, uh, of the uh, ritual. So it's, it's a major undertaking. So that's covered uh, both the action and uh, the beliefs. Uh, I wanna conclude with a story and the story is a hadith. And uh, if you remember hadith is a, a story or saying of the prophet compiled in books. And this uh, hadith is called the hadith of Gabriel. It will be clear why. So uh, the story goes that the messenger is sitting with his companions uh, and this man shows up. Uh, nobody knows him as a stranger and he doesn't have any sign of uh, travel on him. So if you travel through the desert, uh, it, it, it would be seen on you, but uh, so he doesn't have any. So nobody is, uh, everybody's surprised kinda. And he comes and sits close to the prophet and then asks him, oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam. And the prophet just responds, Islam is to testify there is no God but Allah, no God but God with the capital G. And Muhammad is the messenger of Allah to establish prayer, to give charity, to fast the month of Ramadan and to perform the pilgrimage to the house, Kaaba, if one can find a way. So this is what we just uh, touched upon, uh, the five things that a Muslim is supposed to do. Uh, when asked what is Islam, that's the response that the prophet gives. And the man says, you have spoken truthfully, which surprises the companions even more because this person is asking about Islam and then he verifies it as he already knew it. And then the man asks, tell me about faith. And that's the, the, the beliefs that we talked about, right? So, and uh, the prophet says, faith is to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, the last day, and to believe in the divine decree, both, it good, uh, both its good and its evil. So this is again, what we have covered in the beliefs that uh, in the list of, uh, in the, uh, what do you call them? Uh, all the beliefs, the six beliefs that we have uh, talked about. And the response by the stranger is again, you have spoken truthfully. And then finally he says, tell me about excellence. And the word he used here is Ihsan, uh, which uh, is hard to translate, but excellence seems to be uh, what most people use. Uh, it's basically acting in the best way, performing uh, in a perfect behavior, uh, excellence. So 
the prophet responds, excellence is that you worship God as if seeing him. For even if you do not see him, he certainly sees you. So, uh, and uh, the, the key here, I mean, the, the story goes on. There are a couple more questions back and forth, but I'm gonna stop here. Uh, let me just finish it by saying, uh, eventually the man uh, uh, asks more questions and goes away and the prophet turns to his companions and asks them, uh, do you know who that was? Uh, and they respond, uh, uh, the messenger knows best. And the messenger says, uh, that was angel Gabriel who came you here to teach you your religion. So this was kind of an exercise to, uh, for the benefit of the companions, uh, uh, what the question answers, it's a, met it's a teaching method, right? Uh, so, uh, and the, the, the final point here I'm gonna, I would like to talk about is this excellence, this Isan concept, because uh, uh, it's, he, he says, excellence is that you worship God as if seeing him. And by worship, uh, you don't just limit that to uh, the daily prayers or, uh, or being in the worship service. Uh, we're talking about because our mission on earth, uh, that's why we are here, is to worship God. Everything we do is, uh, is supposed to be worship. So if you act like you see God, uh, similar to, like, I mean, this, the, the concept is clear here, I, I assume. Like if you, if you have a teacher looking at you, uh, it's harder to do something that the teacher don't, doesn't want you to do. As soon as he turns around or walks out, uh, you feel like you have more freedom to do, or you, you, uh, it's easier to do things that he doesn't want you to do. So as long as you are in the presence of a person that you respect and don't want to disappoint, uh, you watch yourself even closer. You act differently, uh, and even that presence here, it's God. Uh, we know that God is all hearing, all seeing, and he sees us. So if you just can live at that level uh, where you always see God, uh, that is uh, the, the level of excellence. Uh, and the idea here is that there's only so much you can do for yourself in terms of worship. Eventually, uh, to please God, uh, who's watching you constantly, you have to start doing something else, and that's would be to serve God's creation. Uh, so uh, serving other humans would be the first that comes to mind, uh, serving nature, serving uh, everything that is created and protecting it. And uh, that would be uh, the level of excellence. Uh, and with that, let me come to my final slide. So I just wanna summarize everything we have talked about here. Uh, so we talked about uh, practice or deeds, uh, what we call Islam. So the things that a Muslim does. And this is kind of the first level of faith, if you, if you will. Uh, a seven-year-old child can mimic uh, the prayer of an adult perfectly. Uh, doesn't mean she understands what uh, why she, we are doing those motions. She doesn't, doesn't mean she's actually understanding uh, that we are in the presence of God. Uh, it, it just means she is following the, the pra practices. It's, it's, it's just outerly practices. And that's kind of the first level uh, in Islam. You, you just do the actions. Uh, like most kids in a Muslim family, they will kind of go through that le uh, level where they just blindly mimic their parents. Uh, without knowing. The next level is Iman or faith. And now we talked about, about all the six uh, things that Muslims believe in. Uh, and it, it, it makes more sense if you think about this way. So why do we worship or how do we worship? We worship in this particular form because the prophet has taught us and the prophet has taught us with the information he received in the holy book, which he received via the angel from God. So that chain uh, is required. You have to believe in these uh, to make, for, for everything to make sense so that you understand uh, why you do those actions. So, uh, or in other words, you have internalized your actions now. You are doing it 
uh, knowingly, understandingly. And then the third level is what we just talked about uh, and uh, the prophet defined as being in the presence of God. Uh, so it's excellence or doing what is beautiful, doing uh, everything in a perfect manner. And uh, what should lead you to serve God's creation uh, and serve other people, uh, service. So uh, we can think about the Islam part as uh, the bodily functions, that the actions that we do with our body, the Iman or faith part as what we do with your intellect, with your mind, we decide, we choose to believe in this and that. And then Isan is kind of soul, the body and mind constantly working to polish our soul, to elevate us to that level that we want to be at, uh, to get as close to that level as possible. Uh, there are uh, scholars who use uh, another analogy uh, as a tree. So fate is kind of the root of that tree. Uh, and then deeds, so the actions, the prayers, the fasting is the trunk. Uh, obviously you have to have strong faith for the tree to stay strong. You have to have strong enough uh, trunk so that it can carry the, the branches and the leaves and most importantly, the fruit, which is excellence. So uh, we just covered uh, lots of material uh, in a short time. Uh, the idea here was to start from very basic, uh, basically what Islam is teaching and uh, why is it teaching it and get to, you, get to a point where we know what the ultimate goal for Muslims are and why we do things and why we believe in things we believe in. Hopefully that was uh, beneficial uh, for you. Uh, please uh, let us know by putting comments until this, uh, under this video. And if you have any questions, I would love to uh, hear them uh, or see them uh, in the comments as well. Thank you very much. So I have to... I don't see any questions at this point. So I'm just gonna conclude it here. Thank you very much.